Good morning. Good morning, everyone. I am Lyman Claiborne, the coordinator of services for older adults at Brooklyn Public Library. Welcome to our program today and thank you so much for coming. Uh, this is a continuation of our celebration of Immigrant Heritage Week. And speaking of immigrant services, my colleague Janelle Peterson, Janelle wave at everyone, has partnered with Services for Older Adults on this particular program. And also we have Words Without Borders partnering with us today and you'll meet some of those people later. Let me start with some housekeeping updates. Everyone is on mute when you come into the room, please stay on mute. Um, but if you need to ask a question, don't forget to unmute yourself. Um, and you can unmute yourself to ask questions when the author asks for questions. Just remember to mute yourself back after the questions. Number two, we do have chat. Obviously, in every Zoom meeting, there's chat. Um, Brooklyn Public Library staff will be monitoring the chat in uh, both Chinese and English. And so we will answer your questions that way if you want to do that. Don't forget to join us next week, same time. 11 o'clock Wednesday, we will continue this talk with our author. If you've registered for this one, you're already registered for that one. I also want to point out there will be surveys that we would really, really, really love you to fill out at the end of this program, um, but I will email those to you as well um, because we definitely value your feedback. And then I do have to read this disclaimer because the program is being recorded and may be broadcast live. That is in speaker mode, but anyone who does not wish for their image or voice to be shared as part of the broadcast, please turn off your camera and microphone at this time. Also be aware your name may appear in your Zoom window, so you may want to change that if you don't want that displayed. Uh, so we are having this program recorded today. That is our disclaimer. And now, without further ado, I first want to introduce Yang Li Yao, our supervising librarian at Brooklyn Public Library. Go ahead, Yang Li. Good morning. My name is uh, Yang Li, and I'm here to assist our colleague in order to provide uh, assistance in language. Um, now I'm going to speak Chinese. Uh, 大家好, uh, 我是永热, 我是今天的, uh, 我是布鲁克林公共图书馆的馆员 Chan 就是关于今天的这个节目的问卷。下礼拜三，同样的时间十一点钟，我们还有另外一场活动。那希望大家来参加。OK，那接下来我要介绍的就是我们主办方的Nadia。OK，Nadia, okay, okay, you're next. Thank you, Lyman. 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 Thank you, Lyman.
these descriptions and a short link in the chat. Um, we would love it if you visited us. Um, now it is my pleasure to introduce Wen Wang Huang, a Chicago-based writer, translator, and journalist. He is the author of The Little Red Guard, a memoir that chronicles his growing up in central China during the 1970s, and the co-author of A Death in the Lucky Holiday Hotel, Murder, Money, and an Epic Power Struggle in China, which chronicles the fall of Bo Silai and depicts the inner workings of the Chinese Communist Party. His writing has appeared in the Paris Review, Harper's, the Christian Science Monitor, the Chicago Tribune, and the Asia Literary Review. He has translated Chinese writer Leo Yu's The Corpse Walker, Real Life Stories, China from the Bottom Up, which appears um, in uh, a few chapters of it are on Words Without Borders campus, um, as well as God is Red, for a song in 100 songs, and Yen Xianwei's Women from Shanghai. He received a 2007 Penn Translation Fund Award. And now I'm happy to turn it over to Wen himself. Hello, everyone, and thank you for coming to this session. I want to thank the uh, Words Without Borders and the Brooklyn Public Library for giving me the opportunity to share my family stories and talk a little bit about my book. I feel like it's, I'm on the Oprah show or something, I try to tell you how dysfunctional my family will be, but I hope it's as entertaining. But uh, first, uh, I, uh, my name is Wen Huang. I'm a writer and a translator and a journalist here in Chicago, uh, you know, which truly lives up to its reputation as a windy, cold city. And last night, we only have 32 degrees and still it's pretty cold outside. But I've been here for uh, 32 uh, years. It's uh, my almost my home now, and I feel very comfortable. And uh, in 2009, I published my memoir. The original title of the, my memoir was called Coffin Keeper because the whole book centers around my grandmother's uh, casket, how it uh, affects the uh, changing Chinese social and uh, landscape because I was raised in China. I didn't come over here when I was 25. So that had a tremendous impact on my life. But then uh, during the, the writing process, when the, you know the marketing people, when each time a book is published and you have to consult with the marketing people, they say whether it's good or not, they did not like the title Coffin Keeper, even though in the book, Coffin had a very auspicious meaning to it, but they, they felt like Coffin Keeper sounds too depressing. So they changed it to the little red guard, the little red guard here. And a lot of people, when they read the book, they thought it is a political book about the China's notorious cultural revolution in the, in the 1960s. But truly, it is a book about my family, uh, about my grandmother, and my exploring the universal theme about my relationship with my parents and uh, the stories of my grandmother uh, in China and my parents and how I came over here. So today I want to uh, focus on part of the things is the original theme is as a coffin keeper and how it uh, influenced my life. First, I want to uh, talk to you a little bit about why I decided to uh, write the book. I, I was born in Xi'an, the central, uh, central city. In, it's about northwestern part of China. Nadia, could you show a picture of my hometown? It's, when I was growing up, it used to be a very conservative and a very isolated city. Um, no, the, the city, the picture of the city wall. So, but anyway, so most of you probably have been there. I have seen the, the, this, uh, the terracotta soldiers and that's how our city is associated with this archeological di uh, discovery. And uh, when I was about 11 years old, uh, 10 years old, Richard Nixon, uh, you know, went to visit China 
and China remained isolated for many years and then decided to open up to what many Western countries. So uh, China decided that they needed more people who knew something about the English language because prior to that, anybody who learned English was considered a foreign spy and it could get into trouble. One time a doctor wrote uh, somebody a prescription with the Latin words. And then some of the workers thought that the, the, the teacher thought the Western medicine was superior to Chinese medicine and he got beaten up. So learning a foreign language was considered a taboo in those days. But then after Richard Nixon visited China, suddenly English became very popular. So I was one of the 40 kids who were chosen from the regular primary schools and then to be trained specifically to learn a foreign language. So we could uh, uh, someday defend China's revolution at the United Nations and using English language. So I was trained there for seven years and then I went to Shanghai and uh, uh, when Mao died, China opened up the university system and I was able to go attend one of the best universities in, in Shanghai, China. Shanghai is one of the largest cities, probably many of you have been there as well. And then um, I majored in English literature and writing. And by uh, 1989, most of you probably here remember the Tiananmen Square, the protest movement. And I was a journalist by then. And uh, can you hear the, the, the no noise outside the construction? No, we just hear you. Oh, great. Uh, so uh, during, in 1989, the students, they took to the streets, especially those in Beijing. They went to Tiananmen Square and then uh, launched this nationwide protest against the Chinese government. They asked for political changes and political reforms, opening up to the West and all that. And then you know that on June 3rd, 1989, and the government sent troops in to Tiananmen Square and the CN reported live. And uh, I was one of the students, even though I wasn't the leader. So after the crackdown, there was this huge uh, uh, disappointment within China, especially among students. And many of them have left China. So I was one of the students who left China in 1990. And I uh, landed up in Springfield, Illinois, because a professor that I met uh, told me that there was a journalism program here. And I was desperate to get into China, uh, get out of China, and I landed up here. I thought when I first arrived in Springfield, I thought, you know, each time we've, uh, uh, the, the America we knew at that time was New York City, the big skyscrapers. I thought Springfield was one of those the big cities. So when they they uh, when I got off the plane and they picked me up and they drove me to Springfield, I thought I saw there's a very small town and a lot of cornfield. I thought it was just a transition period. Now I thought the university that I was going to attend was like Harvard. You know, the only thing I knew was from Love Story. I I saw those beautiful uh, uh, Renaissance or whatever, the, the Gothic buildings. When I was there, the only two buildings were the cornfield. Everywhere I look at, I said, oh, wow, this is America. And the, the ironic thing is when I was in China, I hated corn because corn was considered a proletarian food and everybody has to, you have to add 30% of the corn in your diet to show that you are very proletarian. And then after years, I thought I was going to escape that. And then I landed up in the land of corn. And then it was, uh, but it turned out to be the most rewarding thing that uh, for me. And it was the center, the heart of America. And I learned to be a journalist and then I learned to cover US Congress and the state legislatures. And for years, I was determined to get acclimated to the American culture. And I followed US election night. I stayed up all night. I covered it. I covered the property tax, school reforms, anything. And I tried to forget my Chinese because, and then um, I, I always speak English with an accent. I thought if I listen to NPR every day, I follow Scott Simon and all those people try to overcome my accent thinking that uh, I could be you know, treated like a real American. And, you know, like any other new immigrants, you just want to be part of mainstream America. But, you know, as I 
left Springfield and landed in Chicago. And I started work for corporations. And then as I get more comfortable here, everything is situated. And I realized that the past is as resilient as my accent. There is, I couldn't get over this. And I also start to wrestle with my identity, even though, you know, I tried to be very American, but there was also part of me, you always see people very well-intentioned, always ask you, where are you from? When people go to Chinatown, the first thing they, they will do, they'll call me, I'm thinking of you because I'm in Chinatown and the Chinese food. And then when I go back to China and then China said, uh, the Chinese friend said, you are too American, you are American. So we got stuck in between here and what is a true American? So I was struggling, uh, I was struggling with it for quite some time. And one of the ways that uh, to cope with this, and I decided to go back to my family history. And also at that time, and then my mother got very sick and uh, she got sick in China. When I went back to China and I realized that I probably need to visit to uh, visit my family and then try to learn more about my heritage. And at the same time, to how to balance my cultural heritage and my new identity. So that was uh, first initially gave me the idea of writing a book. And to prepare for that, I went back to China and worked for the New York Times there in Beijing. And then uh, I started to learn, relearn Chinese because when I was here for years and years, I was covering uh, US politics and I forgot a lot of the Chinese. And sometimes when the Chinese New Year came up, people say, uh, it's the New Year. I said, oh, really? I have, I totally forgot about the whole thing. So I went back to China and then started to interview people. And that gave me the idea. Another thing is, uh, I when I was struggling with a, saying whether I should write a book, I had no idea where to start. And then one time I uh, was uh, talking to a friend of mine and he asked me, he said, what was your impression of your grandmother? Because uh, his grandmother just passed away. I said, the only thing I remembered about my grandmother is her casket. And this friend said, uh, no, I'm talking about when she was, alive, what did you remember about her? I said, her casket. When she was alive, we had a casket made. And they all thought it was very uh, unique story. When I told them about the story, they found it very uh, interesting. And it was something they had never heard about before. I decided to focus on my grandma's casket. And uh, through this casket, it centers around the whole family relations. It centers around there. That was how this book came about. In 2009, when I was working for a big bank, and then because the financial crisis, and uh, uh, they, the bank moved to another location, they closed the branches in Chicago, and uh, I was laid off. And then I felt like that was the perfect timing to pick up this book. So I wrote this, um, The Little Red Star, the, this current book that you have, uh, you, that you will see that uh, I'm showing this. Uh, do you have any questions for me uh, at this point before I start to talk a little bit about my book? Any questions? Okay, I will. Um, let me just uh, jump in and say that we are providing captioning through total captioning. Um, and if you would like, captions for this talk, um, you go to your bottom toolbar, all the way at the right, you see more, and you enable subtitle there. Um, thanks. Sorry, Wen. I have, Sorry, a question. I have a question for you. Okay. Um, <clears throat> are the educated and the intelligentsia, are they discouraged from coming to live in, in the United States today? I know back in Mao, I, I understand. However, today, is that discouraged? No, actually, a lot of the intelligence, the elite, they want to send their children to the United States or to Europe to, uh, for advanced studies. They feel like a, a couple of reasons. First, if you get a degree over here, they feel like because we have the best educational system here. When, if you get a degree here from like any of the universities here, it's worth more than, that's a practical reason, worth more than, than uh, in Ch the Chinese university. The most important part is they want them to get a Western education 
they feel like it was more marketable. And also a lot of them, they want to use their children. They hope to eventually uh, move over here because the political instability in China, even though a lot of the wealthy people there, they feel like it's not secure there because of the political system. So uh, it's uh, greatly encouraged there, but the government for years, they kind of, uh, they, uh, they made it very difficult to travel. But then during the past 10 years before the, uh, we get to this stage, like during the couple of years, and the government actually set up special agencies to help people prepare their, their enrollment application. And there were hundreds and hundreds of these uh, uh, agencies. Some, sometimes they were supported by the government to help these people. But then during the past several years, because of all the pandemic and also the political tension, and then people got discouraged, especially this year. A lot of people, they even send their kids when they were very young, try to uh, 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 11, 12 or 13, and then they got stuck here. And then they also worry about getting uh, persecuted here because you have a lot of the sanctions going on. So that stuff, but even so, the trend is still going up. Any more questions? Thank you, Harold. Thank you. So I want to talk a little bit about my book. Nadia, would you like to put a picture of like the city wall and the terracotta soldiers up there for me? So, oh, the Sorry, when I, I don't seem to have the city wall. I have the, the two pictures of the soldiers. Okay, that's fine. Um, great, thank you. Um, so I was uh, born in Xi'an. I told you that it's in central part of China. The, the Xi'an, what is, uh, every time if you go to China or if you uh, miss Chinese, you mention Xi'an, they always uh, associate with an Asian city because it was the capital of the 14 dynasties in, uh, in China. It was an Asian capital. And one of the prominent things about Xi'an is the emperor's tombs. As you know, this is the first emperor's tomb who, great, who built the Great Wall, Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi. And, uh, but there were 80 tomb clusters for emperors and the royal families in Xi'an. And uh, when I was a kid, I used to, my dad used to drive me around the, the city surrounding areas. We would see this beautiful hill, uh, beautiful hill. I would ask, I say, "What is that?" My dad would say, "Oh, this is the 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 gravesite for one of the which emperor, that emperor, or this is the gravesite for this emperor, that emperor." So the, we were surrounded by these people. And then one year, I took a a, a professor to uh, to China. So we went to a big pu uh, a public outhouse. There it was so dirty outhouse, and they had to put the bricks on the floor because of the water all over so the, the 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 dirty water not get to your feet and the way my professor looked at one of the bricks on the uh on the floor and realized that was a uh, Qing dynasty which means which means man was in the 17th century a tomb tablet and the peasant did not re uh, realize its value they just put it up there at the outhouse at the floor so it's it's what uh it's famous for these emperor's tombs. For a while, the city was known as the, the Valley of Emperor's Tombs. So because it's more than Egypt. And then, as you know, that uh, a lot of the emperors, the, the mausoleums or the tombs, they start to build their, emperor, uh, their, their tombs the second day after they were enthroned. Like Emperor Qin Shi Huangdi built the, the terracotta soldiers was when he was only uh, 13 years old or 12 or 13 years old, he started to build his tomb. So they believe this afterlife. Of course, the terracotta soldiers I'm showing you here, as you probably know, 1970, uh, 74, and then when uh, peasants were digging a well, and then they were just accidentally uh, found some terracotta pieces. They just sold it ten, uh, $1 to some commercial vendors. And later on, when, when the archeologists, they found out, they realized this uh, beautiful array of terracotta army was actually uh, in part of the emperor's tomb, the first emperor's tomb, which is on the big hill. And right now they cannot ex excavate. Because the reason they built this army, because they believe that uh, in the afterlife, that uh, everything you enjoy in this life, you can bring to the other life. 
So uh, they, in the old days, they even uh, uh, execute the, 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 the servants or the concubines so that they could go with the emperor to the next world. And then so they paid a lot of attention to this burial on the funeral culture. That kind of, uh, this kind of mindset had a huge major impact on ordinary people. So for a lot of people in China, when we were growing up, it, it was very, life was very poor. China was, uh, we didn't even have enough to eat. We live, live in a ration system. Every month you can, you only got a certain amount of wheat and the corn and the pork, like a pound of pork, uh, pork and that stuff. But people, even despite the hard life, they would save for the, the two things is weddings and then the funerals. Funeral was considered a huge, important part of this uh, life. And the ordinary people, of course, they don't want, uh, they are not hoping to get uh, uh, 8,000 to 80,000 terracotta army soldiers in the tomb, but they want a proper burial because that one is the, the superstition had it that the location of the burial, if you give a proper burial to the dead, and then it will, pros the future generation will uh, prosper or will benefit uh, your current family. So they paid a lot of attention to that based on this culture. And then so my grandmother decided to follow this uh, the tradition as well. So when she was 73 years old, and the Chinese tradition is if when you reach a certain age, there was the vulnerable, you tend to be very vulnerable health-wise. You could die easily. So the Chinese, they randomly think they said 73 and 84. That's the, the two uh, thresholds that you need to be careful and prepare. So when my grandmother was 73 years old, she decided that she could die. And so happened that uh, before her birthday, she had a uh, illness. She had a fever and she uh, the doctor couldn't find out what the problem was. So she thought she was going to die. And then she uh, asked my dad to promise her that uh, she had to be buried if she if she died. And uh, my dad had no choice. So on her birthday, 2073rd birthday, rather than giving her a, a birthday cake, she uh, my, my father made a coffin for my grandmother. And you think it's kind of creepy now in our culture here, but in China it was considered a very auspicious thing to do because coffin rhymed with the word with a uh, right with means like uh, you will prosper both both in career and uh, in uh, family fortune. So uh, guan cai guan mean being uh, official them cai mean wealth. So it was an auspicious thing for uh, uh, to do. And uh, when after the coffin was made, and we didn't have a place to play. It. So where do we do? We only have this, uh, in those days, housing is a big problem in China. We have seven people in the household. And then could you put, uh, Nadia, could you put a, a, a photo of my, my family? So we want seven people living in one household. Seven, no, this is not my family, Nadia. We, can, we don't have to worry about it, but anyway. So, so uh, seven people live in one big house and we didn't have a uh, well, two room house. We didn't have the place to place the coffin. So they placed next to my bed. So I literally slept next to a coffin for three years before I went to the boarding school. And uh, so this is the, uh, I was, I'm not in the picture because I was away in college. This photo was taken by uh, it was taken in 1984, and uh, in the middle was my grandmother, and she had bound feet, and uh, my father and my parents and my uh, younger sister and my younger brother in the, in the photo. Uh, so after we made the coffin, for the rest of the years, uh, my, my grandma had two requests. First, she had to be buried. S second, she had to be sent back to her native village which is in another province. She wanted to reunite with her husband who died when my grandmother was only 29 years old. So that was two requests and put my father in a very terrible dilemma because in those days, China just uh, issued a ban on burial for both reasons. First, 
because China, as China was developing, and they had the population was exploding, and they did not have enough space for barrels. So they issued a ban saying that uh, cremation was the norm and barrel was, was illegal. And also uh, second part, they feel like the traditional funeral culture after Mao took over China, the, the communist became the, the dominant ideology. Communism was the atheist, uh, uh, the, uh, we're all atheists. And then uh, the, a lot of funeral cultures involved different rituals that were considered superstitious. So in major cities, in the, in the countryside, you could still bury people, but in the major cities, a ban was very strictly enforced, the ban. And uh, if you died in the hospital and you could not move the, 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 the body and the doctor immediately, they, they send people over and put in a morgue and then they send it to the crematorium. So my dad had a very, very hard time after we, the coffin was made. And then, so for the next uh, 16 years and our whole family, we planned how to get my first, how to get this coffin, uh, uh, hide, uh, we tried to, uh, try to hide the coffin from friends and families and we covered it up. The second part is what if my grandmother died, how we're we going to transport the coffin to her native village and got it buried. So my father, during the day, he was a communist party official and tried to tow the party line and then, uh, shouting this anti-superstitious slogan and then uh, obeying the party orders. And at night, our families got together. We tried to plan our, our families, uh, the funeral. And uh, since it was costly and my father saved every penny. And for years that I always wanted to do something. When I was a kid, I loved to play the violin. And my father said, no, 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 we have to save for your grandmother and I would, uh, for the grandmother's funeral. And I try to have a new uh, pair of shoes and say, no, 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 we have to save for your grandmother. So we had several plans worked out. So first plan is in case my, my grandmother died in the winter, what we should do. And we would uh, uh, bribe some officials at the transportation department. They would get us a car and would transport the, my grandma's body through a different route and then for two days and it got to her home village. And then we bribed the officials of the village and how they would uh, uh, allow our grandmother to, to, bury next, to be buried next to her husband. Or if she died in the summer, what are we going to do? We have to bribe some officials at the railway station. And then how are we going to get on the train for two or three hours? And then got her into uh, uh, another cart and then got her buried. And, you know, we got all these meticulous plans uh, uh, worked out. And then, but my, my grandmother, even though for when he, she was 73, we started preparing it. And she lived all the way up to when she was 90. And during this time, every couple of every couple of years, she would uh, have this episode, thinking she was going to die. And one night, we were all sleeping next to her, and then she suddenly called everybody up, saying she decided she was going to die. And then I was half asleep. She brought me back because I was the oldest son, uh, oldest grandson. And then she started to say, "Oh, I'm going to die. That's how I'm going to tell you what to do, and get all the wills ready." And then after that. My dad immediately got the, 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 the doctor over and get, gave her some sleeping pills. And then she just, she's doing well again. So just la last like this all the way till even my father, she outlasted my father. And then it was my job later on to transport the, 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 the coffin and making sure it was buried. And the ban was more strictly enforced. Even when she died in 1989, we had uh, we did something with my sister-in-law when my uh, sister was getting married, and we brought my brother-in-law, not not my sister-in-law, my brother-in-law into the, this whole plan. And then he was managed to get some plot of land near Xi'an because we were not able to get to Henan. And even today, we still have not fulfilled that uh, the wish. And my grandmother is still in Xi'an, she was buried in Xi'an in 1989. I'm still trying to figure out how to get her back to her native village. I went back twice 
And then uh, right now with the rapid development of um, you know, China during the past 20 years, the uh, urban construction, if you go back to Xi'an, Shanghai, could no longer recognize what it was because all these new buildings uh, got up and all the tombs have been transported. We couldn't even find uh, our grandfather's uh, funeral. So that was the whole book about. And while I was writing the book and writing about my grandmother's the coffin and the casket, it, I suddenly realized how it played a central role in our family relationship and also in uh, the way that we, uh, we lived with each other like for years and years. And I had this very, my parents, my mother and my dad had this very tense relationship because my, my father was so consumed with my grandmother's last wishes. The reason being is all paying debts back to his mother because when my grandmother, uh, when my father was ha uh, six months old, his father died and my grandmother, they, uh, uh, what used to belong to a very big wealthy family. But then when famine came and the Japanese invaded China, they became so destitute. So my grandmother never married again because she was worried that uh, her, uh, my, uh, whoever she was going to marry could mistreat my father. So she actually like, single-handedly raised my father and then brought my father from one province to another to Xi'an. So my father felt so indebted to his mother. He felt like the only thing he could pay back his debt was to fulfill his mother's last wish. And then he was so consumed by it. I don't think he had any love for my mother or for, any, for, any, for anybody else. And then it causes so much tension in the work. And then also because my grandmother, I was the eldest son in the tr traditional Chinese uh, culture. The son was also preferred over the daughter because my grandmother used to say that uh, daughters are like a water poured out of pitcher. You never get it back because after they get married, they live with their husband's family, they become part of their, their husband's family and you cannot rely on them. So it's the sons are very important. So I was the, 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 the eldest grandson, I was too supposed to be, she, she doted on me so much and then caused tension between my mother and my grandmother and me. So when I was sorting out this whole thing, it's really in a way it was very dysfunctional like any other American families. But on the other hand, it was this underlying theme of this universal you know, family values and no matter what political system you live on, these family ties and this relationship, these tensions, they all exist. So throughout this book, actually, I was able to sort it out. It's like a therapy session, sorted out my relationship with my parents. And it was getting me a new perspective on things. I had a better understanding with my mother, understand her situation and also, uh, through this whole casket uh, fiasco, I will say, I got to know more deep down about my heritage and also about Chinese cultures. That really helped me define my uh, who I am now. And after I wrote the book, and I started to do more about China, research more about Chinese history, translate more works about uh, uh, Chinese literature into to, to English to introduce them to American or Western audience. It really made me, I think it makes me feel more balanced that uh, to, as I'm exploring my identity, especially at this time, and it's so important for, uh, for me and other Asian Americans. So that's the reason that's what I got from the book. I think uh, I've uh, said enough and uh, shall we open up to questions from the, the audience? When also, if you would like to show the city walls now, I have the picture up. No worries. No, we, we don't, we can just, uh, doesn't matter. Yeah, I have a question. Great. How many miles away from where you were to, to where the cemetery was, where you wanted to take your mom, or your grandma? It's actually, it's about uh, 300, uh, no, it's about 500 miles away. So it, it's right now when China built up the, the fast trains, it only took three hours. But in those days when transportation was not available, there was only a slow train. And in those days, it, it seemed like another uh, foreign country so far away. 
and I went to take another uh, trip like five years ago. It took so long, but for that, for years and years, we were back and forth and tried to thinking as if like we're trying to transport my, my grandmother back to another, uh, another country, but it was not too far away at all. But even now, because the, we could no longer locate my grandfather's grave because of the development, they built this uh, new uh, uh, condos and uh, some museums. And then they, they uh, all over China, it's the same thing. They demolish all the graveyards. Uh, and uh, the slogan is the dead has to make room for the living. So it's really a very sad situation in a way because in the old days, the whole cemeteries, the, 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 is, is the, the tie between the present and the past and you don't have a past to go back to. You cannot trace who you are. We don't even know what happened to my grandma, grandfather's tomb. So that's the situation in China. We do have a question in the chat, Wynn. Okay. It's uh, from a patron about your grandmother. Okay. Did she, did she ever feel badly for putting a burden on her son, which cost him so much in terms of relationships, finances, and his own life? Or did she regard this as her just due? She never felt guilty or regretful because she felt like she was not doing it for herself. She was doing it for the future generation. She constantly, she would, she would tell me, that uh, uh, I, I used to ask her, so why do you always want to go back? We're all here. Even after you die, nobody's going to pay attention to you. You are way out there. And she said, oh, your grandfather was buried uh, uh, near the Yellow River. And then they were uh, straddling between a, a very auspicious location. And it was a dragon in there. If I get buried in there and reunite with your grandfather and you will get into college and then the, you will have, you know, the family, the fortune will just rise. And she, that's how she was thinking that she was doing us a big favor. That's the whole tradition is the afterlife has a big impact on the future generation. And then we have another patron who has a two-part question. Sure. Hi, hi Wen. I'm curious to know what it meant for you to leave China, given your role as eldest male in the family. And then part two of that is, um, did your other siblings immigrate? I was the only one. I'm the only one who is here. All my siblings, they stayed in China. I, that was a great question. In the Chinese tradition is that uh, uh, the eldest son, you are in charge of the whole family, the whole uh, family, and you're not supposed to leave China. But then in the, during the Mao's revolution, there was also part of the Chinese tradition is that Korea sometimes is more important. And then in those days, I was struggling with it. I could have left China way early, but my grandmother, because I was so attached to her, she became my surrogate mother in a way. And also my father had cancer. And then during that, I waited for two years after both they passed away and I came back. But sometimes I still feel uh, guilty for leaving the whole family because when my mother passed away, she was alone and uh, she fell from the floor for, for uh, a day, nobody discovered her. And then the guilt still is haunting me. Sometimes I wish that I was home and then could have prevented it. So this is always with, with all immigrants, I think is the, uh, the struggle with how you, you want your career and you want to build a better life. At the other hand, at the time, the family obligations. Most of the times, I think the families in China, they supported me. And I think with other immigrants in other countries too, they always felt like America, this is such a, you have uh, more room for improvement. It's such a great country. And once you go in there, you probably can help with uh, the rest of the family. And that's the mentality. Thank you. We have a new question. And by the way, just to let everyone know, it's quarter till 12 noon. When you wrote this memoir in English, did you also encounter the problem of being stuck in between two different languages in terms of your bilingual practices? How did you overcome it? Thank you. That's a great question. But by the time when I uh, first got here, it was I constantly struggled with uh, my bilingual, the dilemma, I would um, 
when I was writing a paper or writing something, I would sometimes think about Chinese first, and then I had to translate into English. And then during the past, uh, uh, I wrote the memoir in 2009, which means I'd already been in the United States for nearly 18 years. During that 18 year period, since I use English as, as my working language, I was a speechwriter for corporations. I gradually transitioned to uh, thinking in English. So when I was writing the memoir, actually I thought in English and it was purely the, the way I, um, uh, during the whole creative process it was all in English. And now the book is going to be translated back into Chinese. And I couldn't do that because my Chinese uh, language skills have deteriorated so much. So I look for, I got a Chinese translator. We're working on it to translate back uh, into uh, Chinese. It has not gotten published because there were certain passages about uh, my involvement in Tiananmen Square and certain things that uh, the publishers, they don't want wanted there, but I don't want to cut it out because it's an important part of me. So we're still trying to figure out, but that was how the book came out. Thank you, Wynn. Here's our next question. And by the way, it kind of leads into next week's program with you. Um, the patron says, thank you so much for this engaging discussion. My question is, what advice do you have for people who are interested in writing their own family histories as memoirs or historical fiction? I, uh, during the past 10 years, each time I uh, talk with people, this is a very good question actually, a lot of people ask me, saying I have this amazing family story and uh, how should I go about doing that? My question, first question is, uh, my first piece of advice is, I think if you have a great uh, story, you shouldn't talk about it more. You should write it down first. Write it down just as a draft. You may not have any uh, uh, training in, um, in creative writing or writing a memoir, but I think that you should just, whatever came to your mind, write it down, put it in a draft. Put in a, once you have something written down and you can go back to revise and gradually, when you learn the certain techniques, you need to shape it into a memoir rather than just talk about it. Most of the time you, you talk about for 10 years, you don't have anything. So before you think about, should I get an agent? Should I get published? You should write it down. The another big benefit of writing down is write, when, it, when you talk about it, one thing, when you actually write it down, it is a different process. It forces you to confront your past in an honest way. It is truly like seeing a therapist. And then you will encounter a lot of the problems when you, you never thought about when you were talking to somebody about it. So when you write it down, you encounter these problems and then you have to go resolve it. You have to do research to do it. And this whole process is very therapeutic. Even though after you struggle with that and then you you write up a uh, uh, 70,000 word or 80,000 word, you know, this manuscript, you wouldn't get it published, but you can, it takes time, you find people to do it, but it's also for your own good. I think it's, a, it's such a release. You will find it really, really uh, very therapeutic, very rewarding. That's my advice. Thank you. The floodgates have opened. The questions are really coming in. Okay, but the next Great. one, the next one is um, about two parts as well. Many times in history and in many countries, parents tend to send their kids abroad to have better lives, despite the family split. How do your relatives like that? And then part two: Was the Chinese government in favor of immigrations of young people? Have you suffered any? government restrictions as an immigrant. Thank you. I am a Cuban immigrant and that's why I am asking. Thank you. So the first part of the question is, yes, this I think is that in all over the world, probably immigrants, especially relating to current immigration process, uh, process like that they want their children separate, they want their children to be here first. Because a lot of people, uh, uh, especially in developing countries like China, when they send it over, they feel like it is a separation. They don't want, like my mother and my parents, many people say, why do you, your eldest son, why do you send him to America where you are here by yourself? 
she always says, well, it's only for her own good. And I can't stop her for developing a bright future. If I keep her here, if she doesn't, have, if he doesn't have a career, he's going to play mommy. So it's for, I would rather sacrifice myself, but for the sake of my children, I want them to live a better life. So they, uh, my mother never hesitated in, uh, you know, when I told her that I was ready to leave China, she fully supported me, she raised money, and then tried to buy me clothes and stuff to support me. So there was the part, but then, you know, for us, when we were young, you never think about that much. You just think, oh my God, it's good for me. I want to build a new life. Maybe when, I, um, when I'm doing very well, I can go back and help my family. That's the mentality of it. But in China, I think in the, in the early days and uh, uh, the government, they tried to stop young people because the brain drain, like people like me who graduated from the best universities and we just got our graduate degree and the Chinese government paid for our, I didn't pay uh, tuition when I was in college. And then afterwards, they, we, we all left. And the Chinese government, they put on all kinds of restrictions. If you graduate from college, you have to serve the country, the motherland for five years before you are allowed to apply for American colleges. But later on, the policy changes. Ch uh, the Chinese government realized that if you send these bright young people over to abroad, maybe someday some of them will come back, they'll benefit. They know they wouldn't stop it. But uh, nowadays, I think the, the, the trend might reverse because a lot of people, like I said earlier, and people did not think it's a completely great idea to send people here because the, the tension, they're worried about getting caught in the middle. Thank you. The next question from the patron says, thank you very much, Wing. A really fascinating talk. Is there a tradition of writing autobiography in China that you drew from? Or do you see your book more in the tradition of American immigrant autobiography? Great, thank you. In China, we don't have this tradition. It was very hard for me to write this memoir because for years I worked as a journalist and I like to interview people and I like to hear other people's stories. And it, it seems like they're more interesting to me. And then when I started writing about it, I when I wrote about my grandmother and my mother, I also tend to be very detached. It's almost like I was describing somebody else rather than my another family rather than my own. So my editor gave me some, uh, some great advice. They always said, you're too detached. The memoir is about you. So it was a huge, it, it, it took me a while to reconcile these two different traditions. And I was uh, greatly influenced by a lot of the uh, memoirs here in this country. Uh, once I started writing this, I started to read uh, memoirs by other, by, by, other people and I got uh, uh, you know, a gist of it. And also my journalistic training as a writer, that helped a little bit, uh, but it was not. And also there was one thing, because in China, every time we were growing up, it was a collective thinking, not individualistic thing like we do here. The country uh, is more important than the family and the individuals, it doesn't matter, it's all for the collective good. So for years and years, I keep using the word we, we did this, we did that, rather than I did this, I did that. That was a switch during the memoir process. My editor keep asking. So I'm not asking about we, I'm asking about what you did. So that was uh, a kind of uh, the, the, the switch. What's the, the second part, the, 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 the memoir? Uh, that, was, that was the whole question. Great, yeah. great, thank you. Um, the next question is, is there a group or association of Chinese writers that you know that you know about in the United States? I know some Asian American writers group, but I'm not part of it because I I'm more of a journalist. I had never training in memoir writing. That was my first one. And I'm writing another pseudo memoir. But it's a fictional thing right now. I just finished it about my boarding school, but I not associate with anything. If this person, uh, whoever asked the question, you can give me your email. I can uh, find, find out two. I know one organization, I can give them your contact information if you are interested. Thank you. Uh, so that's all the questions thus far in the chat. 
Um, well, wait a minute. I think one just came in and we are looking at five minutes till closing. So this question says, picking up on the individualism culture, which is less pre prevalent in Chinese culture, it is touching the family devoted such resources to honoring Wen's grandma's wishes and faith. But are some members of the family prioritized over others then? Yes, in the in the traditional families, this is a very good good question. Within the family, the 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 the, the order is the matriarch, the patriarch is the most important thing. That was a traditional way. Of course, the, in recent years, the the uh, one child policy has such a tremendous impact. So the kid becomes the central point. All parents, they are the little emperors. The parents surround, you know, they every of the activities, activities center around the child. But when we were growing up in the family, is the matriarch. That's why my grandmother's the her last wish trumps trumped everything else. And then of course it's me, the eldest son, my education. And my future was that came up, you know, even though I was, I had to go to Shanghai to study and my grandmother wouldn't want me to. And then she thought it was a conspiracy by my mother deliberately to, to drive me away. And she cried at night and things like that. But that was the, the, the order. Like my grandmother was always the matriarch of the family. She, her needs trumped everything else. When we had a dinner, before we could touch our food, our grandmother had to have her food first before we could touch our chopsticks. So that's what the order of things. And then the eldest son and the eldest grandchild, grandson, you know, is in the order of things. Uh, their things, everybody has to support this priority. Thank you. I think you may, um, let me see. I think we have a question, yes from Barbara. Okay, thank you so much for this. How do most Chinese view degrees which have been granted by US colleges where all the instruction has been done in China by professors who have delivered the instruction in China? They, uh, in, uh, in my time, in the 80s, 90s, if you get a degree in the United States or in Europe, it's called gold, plate, uh, gold plated. I mean, it's worth more. It's you. You said if you say I'm going abroad, people always use the word. You are going to get gold plated. It's worth more than when you get it in China, and that was the time. Even today, it's still the same thing. A lot of people they send the kids to China was for two reasons. First, China has paid so much attention to the sorry to the passive thinking of uh, this. Uh, examinations. Every child right now in China, when, when they enter elementary school to college, they spend about, they only sleep for about six or seven hours homework to prepare for this exam when they have to take a very stringent exam from elementary to junior high, junior high to senior high, you have examinations. And when I was during the, uh, uh, after high school, I had to take the national college entrance exam. And for three days, I prepared for two years. Every night I spent, I slept for three or four hours. And then they, we had the stringent examination and they only recruited three or 4% of the total graduates. If uh, there were millions of students and I, it's, it, it was such a priority and I got to be the first uh, in my province, I was considered such a great honor for the family. And then a lot of students, they couldn't, they, the testing, they feel like it was so uh, uh, passive and then it was, you lacked the, the creativity. All you need to do is duck fed the teachers, uh, duck feed you and they give you the stuff, you memorize everything. And that was it. They feel like that was lacking. So Chinese students, a lot of people, when they failed in the national entrance exam or when they're doing very well, they want to send their kids over to the United States, to the West. So they become more independent thinking. That's also part of the reason that uh, a lot of people, they want to uh, uh, get the degrees here because they feel like people are more capable when they get a degree over abroad. Thank you so much, Wen. And we want to thank you so much for your time and your speaking today. It was very, very fascinating. I do want to thank Words Without Borders also for partnering with us on this. 
if you registered for this program, you are registered for next week's program with WIN. And that one is where you can share your family stories, maybe start writing your own memoirs about the people you grew up with, your favorite childhood foods, your memories of home. It will be another bilingual program and the workshop will be led by WIN. So that will be very, very fascinating next week. Please join us next week. It's the same Zoom link that you got this morning at 10, but I'll send it out again at 10 next week. And if you registered for this week, you're automatically registered for next week. So we do hope to see you then. Please, please uh, fill out the surveys that Nadia enclosed in the chat. Um, and we thank you once again for joining us. Thanks to Services for Older Adults, my colleagues Judy and Janet today. Thanks to Yang Lee for helping us with Brooklyn Public Library. Thanks to Janelle Peterson and her colleague Alex in Immigrant Services with Brooklyn Public Library. And thanks to our captioner today, as well as Nadia, Susanna, and everyone at Words Without Borders. And last but certainly not least, when we really, really appreciate your time, we appreciate your courage, everything you've been through, and you've really been an inspiration to us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Wynn. Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank, Thank you. you. It was Thank wonderful. You. Great talk. It was. Yes, it was. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Wynn. Yes. Thank you. See you next. Thank you. See you next week. See you next week. See you next week. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.